Greetings, sirs and madams. So glad you could join us today because, you guessed it, it's that time of year again. That's right, it's February, that magical month where I talk about all things rareware. Revisiting all my old favorites and catching up on some titles I may have missed over the years. As many of you are probably already aware, I am a fan of the Rareware games just in general. Particular favorites of mine, Donkey Kong 64, Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country 2, Donkey Kong Country 2... Yes, there was a time when I was the Donkey Kong guy. But what's most exciting about these games for me is that there are plenty I have yet to play, new adventures to experience. One of the games for which I am a Johnny-come-lately is the beloved Banjo-Kazooie. Banjo-Kazooie, a game I never got around to playing as a kid. I know, what was I thinking, right? But it's weird to think back to my childhood and how much I hated the look and idea of games that were aimed at me and my demographic. I saw the write-ups and breakdowns of Banjo-Kazooie and Nintendo Power and instantly thought, this game was for kids, ironically forgetting my age at the time. What's weirder is how much I rejected this game while simultaneously being so enamored by Mario and Donkey Kong, especially by their Nintendo 64 iterations, which were pretty obviously aimed at more or less the same audience. There were a lot of these types of happy-go-lucky adventure games back in those days, Banjo-Kazooie being one of a whole host of mascot platformers following hot on the heels of Mario 64. I guess the old barren bird kind of faded into the mire of obscurity beneath them all for me. Like I've said in past videos, back in the day I never really recognized developers for their games, usually just seeing the games themselves as having come out of a vacuum. Donkey Kong 64 eventually became my gold standard back then, but I can review Banjo-Kazooie on its own merits, right? Without resorting to comparison, right? Kinda trying to convince myself here. Beginning the game, I can sort of see how this game might have confirmed some of my biases. It honestly feels like I'm playing a PBS Kids version of a Saturday morning cartoon, sort of if Spongebob was written before cartoon writers figured out how to appeal to adults. It's bright, colorful, and the music is so very goofy, but the only thing that really seems self-aware in all of this, as opposed to completely earnest, is the dialogue. The characters come off as endearing as they are characterized well, or as well as they can be, I suppose, but for the most part I enjoy all of the exchanges that take place here, particularly the one between Bob Models and Kazooie. The two of them constantly sniping at each other adds a nice bit of flavor to an otherwise totally door-in-the-face tutorial system. One big detriment I see right away is the quote-unquote voice acting. Yeah, that got old pretty much at hour one. Sorry, I should read hour point one. I'm not sure there was ever really a time at which I thought the voices in this game were a good idea. What bothers me most about it is that it serves no real purpose. It's bad voice acting that doesn't need to be there. Even just replacing the grunts, belches, and exclamations of uncertainty that are being passed off as conversation with beeps or tones like in Phoenix Wright or Illusion of Gaia would have made this so much more palatable. And let me just say, I am very glad they opted out of something like this for Donkey Kong 64. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to compare. But putting aside the non-mechanical elements of the game for a moment, it plays pretty much like you might expect. Running, jumping, climbing, swimming, and Kazooie is able to learn a series of special moves that further enhance your ability to explore the levels you find and interact with the elements therein. Right from the get-go, I can see that the level design takes on a very distinctive flavor, as one would hope from games of this type. Everything is very open and invites the player to roam and explore freely, and if not everything is immediately accessible, it will be by the time you're finished there, as Bottles hangs around to continue to teach you the extra moves and special abilities you need to get around. When compared to the other games of the age, like say a certain 3D platformer like Mario 64, it came out first to develop comparison, it creates an interesting contrast. Mario 64 locked off certain sections of the level and reconfigured the layouts based on which star you were aiming to get next, requiring the player to participate in singular, more focused runs of each level. In Banjo-Kazooie, everything can be completed ostensibly in one run of a level, in a much more laid-back attitude. These are the subtle changes that create contrasting and complementing techniques of 3D level design being used and explored this early in the concept's infancy. I also love how the game doesn't overload the player with abilities. Every ability the characters gain fits nicely into a control command that makes sense. The double jump flutter, the air attack, invincibility, lunge attack, etc. All of it stays well within the realm of familiarity, and any abilities that are more complicated are indicated and activated by special elements you find along the way. For all intents and purposes, this keeps the game from getting confusing, making sure to have all of these accessibly placed special moves used often so we don't end up forgetting about them when it's suddenly time to use them again. All of these abilities combine to create one serious item hunting arsenal, which is good because this game is pretty much all item hunting. 
Music notes, Jinjos, honeycomb pieces, and the much sought after Golden Jiggies, the complete collection of which being the ultimate goal of this game. Aside from these, there are plenty of ammo and consumable items to collect along the way. This game is remembered as one of the great collectathons, and boy does it live up to that reputation. There is stuff to collect pretty much everywhere, forcing you to look high and low for the special stuff and remember where the ammo is for when you're running low. I was really having fun with the game in the beginning. It's everything I was expecting. I was collecting stuff, fighting stuff, exploring and enjoying. Everything was going swimmingly until the first time I died. The illusion was broken. All was lost! I mean, it's not like the game suddenly became unplayable or anything, but now it's frustrating! Now obviously dying in 3D platformers like these isn't really that big of an issue. You pretty much just have to start the level over again. And yeah, if you get a game over, you have to start from the menu again, but if you're prudent at saving, it really is just a bit more of a walk. But there is one aspect about this game that makes death hit a little bit harder than one might expect. Restarting the level after my first death is when I came upon the infamous revelation that you lose all of your music notes for that level and have to start over again. To the uninitiated, not that big a deal. After all, the game lets you keep the important stuff, the jiggies. Mario makes you look for coins again. Same with Sonic and his rings, Crash and his apples. Seems like a no-brainer until you realize that the notes in Banjo-Kazooie are in fact integral to your progress in the game. Yes, the music notes are what open the level barriers for you. While it adventuring through Grunty's lair. This seems like a pretty noticeable oversight. I mean, when you compare it to Donkey Kong 64, it's not fair to compare. I know Donkey Kong 64 came out after Banjo-Kazooie, but it still presents a problem. This game seems really interested in killing you. I'll admit, I didn't find a lot of the honeycomb pieces at first. I didn't really look terribly hard for them either, but regardless, this game's health system seems designed in a pretty punishing way. The primary source of health regen is defeating enemies but enemies don't respond. In theory, nice, forgiving, less to think about, but when you take into account just how much this game wants to hurt you, such as environmental hazards or fall damage, it becomes quite a problem. There are even penalties for getting puzzles wrong or failing at minigames. Okay, ROM hack idea. A Banjo-Kazooie game where you can torture Mr. Vile to the point of him regretting his own existence so much that he willingly becomes a handbag. Seriously, not sure I understand the logic behind literally punishing the player for trying to engage with the game. Isn't having to try again punishment enough? This game seems intent on making you lose life. It's kind of like Bob and Dot are in my game. With no enemies around to replenish your health, it becomes a very risky venture, even trying to locate the Jiggies. And yes, I know there are beehives that provide you with free health, but eventually the game surrounds them with bees? Bees? Yeah, not gonna be doing that for very long. But seriously, how is that even a good idea? Eventually, you will die, and you will lose a life, having to start the note count all over again. It's worth pointing out that in future titles, as well as the Xbox Live Arcade port of the game, keeping notes found in a level is a feature that is added, implying pretty obviously that hindsight is in fact 2020. I really want to love this game. It's got an excellent pedigree in both directions, and it comes right out of an era of gaming that I love. But there's just so much here that snags my appreciation and unravels it right before my eyes. The way this game handles your health, having to recollect your notes every retry, even the swimming controls are enough to stress me out. Listen to all the sounds I made trying to get used to the swimming. Are you fucking kidding me? No, stop it. Get the fucking note. Get the fucking note. Get the fucking note. Get the fucking note. This is not fun, this is not fun, this is not- Are you fucking kidding me? Won't somebody please tell me what there is to love about this game? <laughs> Fear not, VZ, for I am with you. I am always with you. Is that you, Grant Kirkhope? No, it's me, Snowman, host of You Need to Play and Good Game Design. Oh, please, Mr. Game Design, won't you teach me the ways of the barren bird? Sure thing, as soon as you take this echo filter off my voice. Uh, how's that? Ah, much better, thanks. The thing about Banjo-Kazooie is it just exudes charm. Everything about it is unique and has its own style. It's easy to look back on it today and see its faults, but if you look at it from the lens of a kid playing back in the 90s, it's pretty easy to see why it's still widely renowned as a classic. Every level is memorable and has its own theme. You could see a picture of a level for one second and know what it is. In fact, that happens later in the game when you play Furnace Fun. They knew their levels were memorable. Everything in this game is alive and has personality, even the inanimate objects. Everything has eyes.
eyes, have you noticed this? I know you said you didn't like the voice acting VZ, but I actually did. No game I'd played had done something like that before. I thought it was cute and something different. The game knows what it is, and it doesn't try to be something it's not. Most of all, this game leaves you with a sense of wonder. Every time you open a note door, you think you're at the top, but nope, it's just another giant room in this castle. You always want to see what's coming next. The sense of imagination and wonder I felt playing this game can be summed up by one thing, this ice key in Freeze Easy Peak. The game purposely teases you by showing you this majestic key, but won't let you get anywhere near it. You just have to look at it through this wall of ice. You wonder what the heck it could be used for. I've never seen a game do that before. Sure, games have secrets, but not one that you can never reach. Now, obviously this had to do with Stop and Swap, which is so genius, I could talk about it for a long time, but I'll spare you those details. Just know that the minds behind Banjo-Kazooie had much bigger plans than just a simple little platformer. The beauty in Banjo-Kazooie really shows when you look at it as a whole, and what it stood for at its time of release. The N64 was still fairly new, so it was showing off what the system could do. That's why there's a lot of mini-games and little isolated quests within bigger levels. Each level almost feels like a theme park with different rides to go on, and it just made me feel warm and fuzzy inside. Some would call it nostalgia, but I think it's more than that. It's hard to sell a new IP to users, but I think Banjo worked his way into our hearts because the game had character, charm, and personality. Oh, and as for the note score resetting when you die, just get good. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you because I was too busy playing more than one game for the rest of my life. Contrary to what I thought as a kid, games don't come out of vacuums. They are case studies in learning experiences, almost chronicling a journey through creativity. Rather than compare Banjo-Kazooie to its predecessors or contemporaries, why not see how this game, the first of Rare's forays into 3D platforming, leads into the classics that would follow. For all of its shortcomings, Banjo-Kazooie carries itself with a brilliant sense of wonder. Every level you enter is displayed before you in a sort of tableau, inviting you to dive into that horizon and pick it clean. And even when the game forces you into an enclosed space like Clanker's Cavern, they still find ways to reveal things to you. The segmented areas of Bubble Gloop Swamp gave the impression of a huge old-growth forest surrounding you. Having Clanker waiting for you at the other end of that pipe didn't just amp up the scope, it brought a whole different kind of scope to the table. Giving you a huge dark enemy layer to traverse as the hub world carried with it all kinds of secrets and strange quirks to find, while never letting you forget why you're on this adventure. Even the way this game handled ammo upgrades was a little mind-blowing. You mean the sandcastle in that one level is good for more than just getting a single jiggy? Running, flying, swimming through this huge, seemingly limitless adventure embodies what gaming was all about back in those days. A game that so deftly reminds you of the stakes the story puts in place for you, but encourages the player to look off into that distance, to the top of that mountain, across that lake of burning sand, or into the deep of that forest is a game that prides itself in unadulterated adventure. The way the game allowed the player to explore and experiment to the extent of their own desire captures that sense of wonder perfectly, and places this game squarely at the heart of a genre I love. And that's my long overdue look at Banjo-Kazooie. Lots to get to and only 27 more days to get to it in, so stay tuned for the next installment of February uh, coming later this month. I promise this time. I'm, uh, I'm actually on schedule. Yeah.